All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Global Hotspots. Also, I would like to add in happy Earth Day to all of you. Um, the Global Hotspot series is co-sponsored by the Wisconsin Alumni Association, Plato, and the UW-Madison International Division. On behalf of all of the sponsors, thank you for joining us today for the last Global Hotspots of the season. We will be starting up again next fall. My name is Terry Rayom, and I am a current senior at UW-Madison, as well as an alumni and donor engagement intern at the Wisconsin Alumni Association. Dr. Terry Allendorf is a conservation biologist who has been working on issues of local communities and protected areas since 1994. She is a scientist in the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a research associate with the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. She is also an honorary fellow in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and the Land Tenure Center at the UW. She has been a member of USAID's biodiversity team and a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal. She has worked in Nepal, Myanmar, China, India, Uganda, and Guatemala to develop the capacity of local and national NGOs to design and implement biodiversity, con conservation projects, and co collaboration with local communities. Today, Terry will discuss her research in Nepal, Myanmar, and China. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Terry Allendorf. Hi, everyone, and thanks to Terry for the introduction. It turns out we have the same name, spelled the same way, and we're both Tara Lynn's, too, which is crazy. I've never met another Tara Lynn, so that's exciting. Um, I want to thank the Alumni Association and International Programs. Can, can everyone hear this okay? Okay. For inviting me today to talk on Earth Day. It's kind of exciting to get to talk about the particular research I do on Earth Day. I think it's a very appropriate topic to talk about the values that communities have, not just here and how we feel about the environment, but around the world. And, and as Terry mentioned, particularly in Asia is what I'll be talking about today. So first, I just want to give you a taste of my world view, because you know, before you understand why and how someone does something, it's good to know where they're coming from. So I am a conservation biologist. So to me, the world looks sort of like, like this, where um, a long, long time ago, we put up fences to keep wildlife out of where our homes and our fields are. And nowadays, we have a model like this, where we put up fences to keep them in, because we cover most of the earth. So this is my world view. And some of the protected areas I work in literally look like that cartoon map. So this is an area in Myanmar, Chatin Wildlife Sanctuary. And it is literally, this is the border of the protected area. I don't even need to draw it in. You can see where it is. And this is all agricultural land surrounding it. So it really is an island in a sea of agriculture. Um, and people are living right up against its borders. And Chitwan National Park in Nepal, where I also work, in the 70s was in a very similar situation in terms of uh, US aid was in there. And there's, there's a photograph I need to get from a friend from the 1970s, which looks literally like this cartoon. There are tractors and bulldozers from USAID, USAID ripping apart the terai of the Nepal where the tigers and rhinos and elephants live because they're going to turn it into the breadbasket of Nepal, right? The agricultural land is really great there. So as they're cutting it down, um, USAID and the Nepali professionals are looking and going, huh, where are the tigers and rhinos going to live? And they said, we need to also start thinking about protected areas. And that's how Chatin was, um, Chitwan was officially established. So my research looks at how communities feel about these protected areas that are, that are in their midst, that they're living right up next to and against and have complex relationships with. I have worked primarily in Asia. And usually, these relationships have been thought of in terms of conflicts, because protected areas do cause problems for people, because they rely on the resources that are in the forest, and the protected area has forests, and there's wildlife that can bother them. So there are a large number of conflicts, and that's where most of our focus has been. So as, um, as I mentioned, people can be, they need the resources from the area. And if they go in, they might be fined or jailed for extracting those resources. But that's, maybe they need fuel to cook their dinner, or they need fodder to feed their cows that night. So these are some serious issues. And the wildlife will come out and kill people and livestock and can eat their crops. So an elephant might eat a family's entire crop for the year in one night. So some serious conflicts can occur. Um, as Terry mentioned, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal 
before I began grad school in this research. And this photograph is of a woman, Nirmala Pokhrel, who I lived with back in Peace Corps. And then there's a more recent photo over there with her, her son now. So it's been quite a few years since I first met her, and we're still close. And this slide is just to remind me to say that um, and I learned before I started grad school that people are complex. People have a sense of place no matter where they live. You know, the life is never just about the problems you have and the conflicts, right? There's always these other aspects to your life and the complexity. And that's what I wanted to capture through this research. So starting the research, um, I am a conservation biologist trained in the natural sciences, but I use uh, social sciences to do the work. I call myself, uh, you know, I say I do human dimensions of conservation biology. So I borrow from social psychology, the attitude theory, and sociology for survey methods and analysis. Maybe it's just the sweater against it. Okay, try that. Um, but maybe the most important thing I bring to my research is some approaches from development which focus more on positive aspects. So in development in the last couple of three decades or so, there's been some approaches called like asset-based development and um, I can't take it off because it's in the pocket, an appreciative um, inquiry. And I apply that to my research also. And that's thinking about the world. Sorry, I'm just going to, must be a way to do this. Um, thinking about the world you know, as a glass half full place, not just a glass half empty. <laughs> um, and some of the research that this came out of before it got applied to development, well, first I'll say, so the questions, appreciative inquiry says, the questions you ask determine the answers you get. So if you go in and you ask negative questions about something, you'll generate negative responses. And if you ask positive questions, you generate positive answers. And positive answers can help generate positive actions. Uh, so a couple of places where this has been applied is in medical research. Um, the placebo research is one example where you know, people just believe something as po positive is going to happen, and they can just make it happen. Even if they know it's a placebo, they can actually get better, right? Even though they know that. And then um, positive deviance research is another place where this approach has been used, where, for example, people studying malnutrition among poor children, usually they focused on the malnourished. Why are they malnourished? What contributes to that? How can we fix the problem? And some researchers said, well, let's look at the kids who we would predict would be malnourished because they're poor, but they're not. What are the coping mechanisms their families use in the strategies, right? So they got some positive actions that they could try from that research. So sort of taking that approach to park people relationships. So I'm going to talk about those experiences, Myanmar, China, and India. And why Asia? I want to mention, you know, Asia is particularly interesting, I think, not just because I worked there in, in Peace Corps and am attached to it and attached to Nepal and some other places, but it's also particularly interesting for this research. So there are, this is a map of the red spots or protected areas in Asia, and there are protected areas everywhere, over the, I mean, maps of anywhere in the world look sort of like this. Protected areas are everywhere. But on top of that in Asia, this is a map of population density, and the more dark blue, the more population. So you can see in the area that I work in Asia, Right here, this is the Himalaya and the Southeast Asia. There's a lot of population density there. A lot of people, as I mentioned, living around these protected areas that make it very special and different than other places. And also, there's two biodiversity hotspots. So, speaking of, of hotspots, so you have the Himalayan hotspot here going across Nepal and Bhutan and, North, and India, and then you've got the Southeast Asian hotspot. So, lots of biodiversity. Protected areas, lots of people up against them, and some pretty amazing biodiversity being protected in those areas. And the countries have really diverse approaches to conservation. It spans a whole spectrum from a place like Nepal, where they've been very progressive and in front of um, finding ways to make protected areas and conservation work. Um, so they have more than 20% of their land protected within national parks and reserves, which globally is really high. That's pretty impressive for any country in the world. And they have a lot of innovative approaches, such as um, special programs in the buffer zones of protected areas, where tourism funds go back to local communities for development and other projects. They have co-managed areas, like the Annapurna Conservation Area that you may have heard of, where local people co-manage the area with the government. And community forestry, which protects more than 30% of the forests in Nepal are directly managed by communities. And then you have a country like Myanmar, which um, probably because they have so much of the remaining forest in Southeast Asia, they have over 50% of the forests, actually have not protected very much of it yet. And they don't have many programs. They're just beginning to really start to do that with the opening up that they're facing in terms of a democracy and government change and lots of uh, investment coming in. So they're beginning to start things. So there's a diversity of approaches to conservation in the area. 
But the core of my research, there's some pretty basic questions at the core of every survey in every area that I do. There can be differences, but the core questions are just asking people, do you like or dislike the protected area, the attitude, and then what do you see as the benefits and what do you see as the problems, trying to get the complete picture. So pretty simple questions, but um, pretty interesting answers. And these same basic questions I've used in a variety of contexts, as I mentioned. So um, I'm going to talk mainly today about the protected areas in Nepal, Myanmar, and China and protected areas, in this case, I mean like the official national parks, wildlife reserves mainly. We've also used it though for community sacred forests in Yunnan, China, where with Tibetan communities protect religious sacred forests near the villages. We've used it to look at people's perceptions of forests in Myanmar that are not yet protected, that nobody's really managing and, and how they feel about those forests. And then a couple other things I'm gonna mention at the end are looking at um, people's perceptions of community conservation programs that they work in to find out what are their motivations, what are the pros and cons of participating in conservation programs from a local community's perspective. So for the protected area survey, we've done it for the 4,000 people, around eight protected areas and 150 villages, and we continue to do it in new areas. And just to let you know how we do it a little bit, um, usually I put together survey teams of local people of some kind or another. So in the case of China, um, a colleague, Jianmei Yang here in the middle, she put together uh, a group of four undergrad, and then this is our, our driver, our driver. Uh, so four undergrads who were from the indigenous ethnic communities of the area, they went out and did the surveys in the villages. In the case of Myanmar, we have used um, school teachers for the initial surveys. This is Kain Kain Sui, who went on to become um, a member of an NGO that we still work really closely with. So now she's an environmental professional, and that came out of her working on the, on the team as a school teacher from Chatin Wildlife Sanctuary initially. And this is my son who's come on a few trips with me over the years. And this is what you know, the protected area might look like. So this is Chatin, and that I showed before, and these are all the villages around it. So we attempt to get to every village if we can. So in most cases, we've gone to every village around a protected area and done the survey. So we can really understand village to village even what's happening around a protected area, not, not just sort of summarized for the whole protected area. Uh, so I'm going to start showing numbers and some tables and data, but I just wanted to, to make the point with this slide that Lakshmi Gurung uh, represents sort of the fact that underneath this data and these surveys, every single survey represents a person who we talk to basically about their, their sense of place and their feelings about where they live and what they like and don't like. And Lakshmi Gurung is an example on one extreme case where it's a woman I talked to back in 1996 or 5 when I first started doing these interviews and she was about... 22 years old, living in the village, just had a couple kids, living in her, you know, her in-law's house, as you do in South Asia. And she was so positive. Her sense of place was so strong. She's like, I want to make such a difference. I love this park. I love this village. I want everybody to have a better life. And uh, we had such a great conversation. And she was very inspiring. We sat there for like an hour just chatting. And, uh, and it was interesting because one thing that came up was she was talking about how much she likes to see elephants in the park. And a lot of people will talk about how nice it is just to see wildlife. They don't want it eating their fields, but to see an elephant is, is pretty amazing, a wild elephant. And she was describing the trunk to me and how cool the trunk is. And I said, yeah, you know, in the U.S., I never, I never got to see one of those. We don't have elephants in the U.S. She's like, what? There's something we have that the U.S. doesn't have, right? And she's like, and what about, you know, we talked about we don't have tigers either. We have other carnivores, but not tigers, you know, and we don't have primates. And so she had this sense of place about how amazing the park was without even knowing how truly amazing it was and how special and singular, um, which is a theme that's going to come up later in the data, too, the, the, how much knowledge people have about the protected area is also very important. So I'm going to cut right to the chase in terms of some of the overall lessons that we've learned looking at these surveys. And the most important thing is that people do generally have positive attitudes towards the areas they live around. They will say that they like them. And the best predictor of people saying that is if they see conservation and ecosystem service benefits. So by conservation benefits, I mean that their actual responses are something like, um, well, the area, the benefit is it protects uh, the forest or it protects wildlife or a particular species. And then conservation, and then ecosystem service benefits are people saying things like, well, because we have this protected area here, we have better air, we have a better climate, we have more water, it's healthier for us, our lives are healthier. Um, and so those are the sorts of benefits I mean by that. And third, the people who have knowledge about the protected area are more likely to see those types of benefits. So if they know, for example, when the area was created, who created it, you know, why it was created, sort of knowledge in general, they're more likely to see those types of benefits. And then 
finally, communities, as I've already mentioned, are not homogenous, right? You've got Lakshmi on one end of the spectrum who's so positive, but you also have people who are very, very negative. So even within the village, just like within this room, if I talk to each one of you and did a survey, I'm going to come out with a variety of responses about how important a national park is and how bad it is to have you know, negatives and, and positives about it. In, in every village, everywhere I've been, the same kind of variety. Right? So we have to remember also when we start to sort of summarize a village or a protected area anywhere, yeah, I mean, they're poor, but that doesn't mean they don't have a variety of opinions about something that are really, you know, really different and can have really good conversations with them about it. And so in terms of communities not being homogenous, I'm going to talk about some of the ways we've looked at gender to see how like, the community uh, has different perspectives. So here's some of those uh, numbers I was talking about. So this is showing you um, that people are positive, but ambivalent. So they are positive, they like the areas, but they see problems and benefits. So the darker green is the percentage of people in each of the eight areas that like the area, and the lighter green is, is the percentage that said at least one positive thing of any, of any type, any type of the benefits. And the same for negative, people, the percentage of people who mention something negative. And so it's going in order of the number who like it. So we go from almost 100% in one area in Nepal down to about 45% in Chatin Wildlife Sanctuary, um, which probably has something to do with the fact that there really is no other forest around the area, which means there is more conflict going on. And then you can see, though, that the numbers of, um, numbers of people who see conflicts varies across those protected areas and is not related to the number that say they like it necessarily or the benefits. So each area sort of has a distinct relationship. And this is actually something that now I'm beginning to do more research on and trying to get more areas so we can understand not just at the individual level what's going on, which is what I'm mainly describing today, but across protected areas and across countries. How can we start to understand the relationship and the differences between protected areas and countries? So, and I, my studies are not unusual to find that that many people, 50% or more in most cases, like a protected area. I've gone through every other study I can find on park people relationships that has asked people in some way, shape, or form, how do you feel about the protected area you live next to? And in 78 of 90 protected areas, people, the majority, have a positive attitude and they say they like it. And this is true across, you can see the numbers of um, protected areas and continents here. And Asia is the most negative, like we might predict given the human population densities and poverty dependency on, on natural resources. But still, 31 out of 40 protected areas, people, the majority, are, are positive. So I think this is a pretty common phenomenon across the globe that, that people generally like protected areas that they live next to. To get more into the benefits and problems a little bit so you understand better what they're saying when we ask them that question. So in terms of benefits, I've already described the conservation ecosystem services. People also mention protected area management benefits. And by this, I mean they say things like um, the protected area might have some education programs. In, the, in this context, most they don't have much going on in, in, that, in that sort of way. There's not much funding for education of local communities by protected area management, but there are some. People also mention their village might be safer because there's guards patrolling the protected area, or in the case of Nepal, it's the army. So that may make those villages safer. People feel a little bit safer because someone's patrolling, and so there might not be as much thieving or robber robbery going on. And also, the protected area management has vehicles that they sometimes allow people to borrow. So if you need to get to a hospital, you might be able to ask a protected area person, can I borrow the, the Jeep and get you know, who, my family member to the hospital? And then extraction of, oh, sorry, recreational is also uh, important, especially in Nepal, recreation comes up a lot, you'll see later. And recreational benefits are people saying, I like to go to the protected area for a picnic, for a walk, it's beautiful, green is beautiful, it's shady, it's, you know, it's just nice, I like it there. And then extraction, because people do rely on these areas for a lot of extraction in some cases, more in some than others, but uh, sometimes legally, like in Nepal, they extract thatch legally one time a year to put on the roofs of their houses, and a lot of it is illegal, right? So they're going in on a daily basis to get some fuel wood or some seasonal vegetables or some fodder for their, for their cattle. So we've already talked about two of the problems, the wildlife damage and no extraction. Um, and then protected area management is also a problem because when you're extracting illegally and you get caught, you get fined, beaten, harassed. And in the case of um, Nepal, for example, with the army, they can be, there's always problems with army and, and women and harassment, and there have been cases of rape, none of which came up in my surveys directly, but these are all sort of protected area management and, and conflict with them, which is a key piece of people's attitude towards the protected areas. Often, I think people's attitudes towards the protected areas are so positive as we're seeing, but management is much more of a negative relationship because of government, local community relationships can be really problematic. 
Uh, I already said that, you know, so conservation ecosystem services are one of the best predictors of, of if people like a protected area or not. And this is looking at those eight protected areas in order of the percentage of people that mentioned at least one of these types of benefits. And it sort of amazingly goes in this nice pattern where you've got China here, and you've got the four Myanmar areas, and then the three Nepali areas. And there is a reason for that pattern, I think. Um, in Galilee, we could say it's a really high percentage of people seeing these types of benefits, and a lot of that is water, because this particular protected area is a range of mountains, and the villages are all down, down the slopes, and so they see the protected area up there, and then they get water for their agricultural fields pretty directly from it. So that's a huge component of China, one of the reasons anyway. And then, and then Burma, it's pretty high. Um, for all the areas, and then you ask, well, why in Nepal is it so low? And remember I said they also mentioned recreational benefits in, in, in Nepal? Um, so I think what's happening is when we ask an open-ended question like one of the benefits, you know, if someone asks you something like an open-ended, you list two or three things. You sort of list the first things on top of your head, and, you know, then you're like, you're done. So in Nepal, they have more of a diversity of benefits that they're mentioning, so fewer of them are mentioning that particular benefit. And you can see it here, Looking at then the three Nepal protected areas, that red burgundy line, that's the number mentioning aesthetic, recreational, future benefits. So in Nepal, that's playing a huge role for some reason. Again, one of those national differences we're beginning to look at and try and understand better. Why in Nepal? Is it cultural? Is it because of the huge amount of tourism? Is it because the protected area system was supported by the king and they all really admired the king in the 70s and 80s? You know, in terms of that sort of stuff anyway, they admired him. Um, you know, what, what's the role there? And why in Myanmar are people not seeing that? Maybe it's a religious difference, like the you know, Myanmar Buddhism versus Nepali Hinduism, you know, mixed with Buddhism, who knows? And then, um, and then China, you have a few people mentioning those aesthetic recreational future benefits. So again, like every, now we're starting to see patterns among the countries and within protected areas, which is interesting. But we don't really have enough countries yet to say too much about that. Um, and I think if we, not many other studies have done sort of an open-ended approach to what the benefits are, but here's one on forest patches in Costa Rica. So a lot of studies sort of list what they think the benefits are and have people say yes or no, so they're not really very useful in terms of understanding if my studies match other studies. But in uh, Costa Rica, there's been some good research, and they asked people in open-ended interviewing, you know, what are the benefits just of these forest patches, not even protected areas. And the answer is they look, the numbers look kind of similar in terms of a large percentage saying environmental services and large percentage saying conservation and then the kind of aesthetic values. So, so these are, I think these are global, global values also. And then to get into the gender comparisons a little bit, which gets us into knowledge about protected areas and how important it is. Um, so in Myanmar we found that women were less likely to like the areas and mainly that was because they did not see conservation ecosystem services to the same extent that men did. So that was the, in the model, that was the main predictor, the main explanation. And then in Nepal, we found that women were equally likely to like the area, but also less likely to see CES types of benefits. And in Nepal, we had additional data about the knowledge. In Myanmar, we didn't know how much knowledge they had, but in Nepal, we did. And we found that knowledge explained that gap. If they had had as much knowledge about the protected area, we would predict they would know they would also perceive those types of benefits. So this is sort of the, the piece that shows you how important knowledge is, as I mentioned. And what's interesting, is, so in the South Asian context, it's easy to say, oh, well, women in the South Asian context, they're not as well educated, they don't go to school, they don't go to meetings for the community, it's usually the husbands that will go, so they have less access to information, they just don't know as much. But what's interesting, and I'm putting this cartoon up, this cartoon is sort of referring to the fact that we think of men as hunters, that this phenomenon still exists in the US. If you look up studies on people's attitudes towards wildlife and the environment in the US, you find some similar patterns in that women know less. If you send them a wildlife survey, if you send it to a household, then you say, whoever opens this up, please answer it, because you don't want bias in your gender. Women will hand it off to their husband. So we still have this attitude that, that you know, men know about wildlife, men know more about the environment, and the studies show that that is almost, that it, that can be true. And you see, even in like Norway, there's a study in Norway where they found out that women were not involved in um, protected area committees of volunteers. They were never asked to be on them. They never thought about being on them. And that's a country that's fairly egalitarian. So while we can say we understand the difference in South Asia because women, there's a huge gender gap. They don't have access to resources and education. The gap kind of exists globally. It's another global pattern. And hopefully it's changing fast. I can only hope. Um, so what does this mean in terms of the protected area? Um, patterns and management, how might this impact how we manage protected areas? And we often say that um, 
Protected areas provide global benefits. So for example, you and I sitting here, we get benefits from those poor people in Nepal protecting the tiger. They're suffering all the problems and paying the costs and we're sort of getting these global benefits. And I think what this shows you is that benefits are widespread. They also appreciate those benefits sitting there, right? In fact, they get to actually see those wildlife, which we may never get to do. So the benefits are widespread. You'll find them in every village, in every protected area. They perceive all the benefits that we might think there are from a protected area. And those are really the foundation of the relationship that they have with it. And conflicts are actually not widespread around a protected area. So often the approach to management has been, let's just go in and we just need to provide economic benefits to everyone around a protected area and they'll be convinced to conserve it. And what this shows is that no, people actually, the conflicts are fairly specific from village to village. If we look at you know, wildlife patterns of where they're eating crops, they don't eat everybody's crops equally around the feet or around the protected area. They're going into certain areas more than others. Like elephants have certain routes that they travel on. So they're more likely to hit certain villages. So the mitigation efforts need to be fairly specific, not sort of just, oh, economic benefits across the board. We need to really work specifically on the conflicts that people have, the lack of resources. Money doesn't always solve a problem when you don't have, you know, you can't get a particular resource. There can be other solutions than that to figuring, you know, to figure out how to solve the problem. And so for management, that means, you know, less provision of, like, general benefits, as I said, and more emphasis on effectively mitigating conflicts. And then I want to briefly talk about um, tiger rangers in Nepal and community forest guards in Manas Biosphere Reserve. And this is looking at people's motivations and benefits from participating in conservation programs. So we often hear when I give talks on community conservation, people do often ask, even researchers in the field, even professors on this campus who work with communities say, well, why would someone do conservation if they don't get money? If there's not like a direct economic benefit of some sort, what motivates them? Um, and what we found when we asked sort of similar questions as we did for protected areas is that people perceive multiple benefits and they can change over time and be strengthened in terms of conservation. So a colleague of mine had a tiger um, ranger program in Nepal where he trained 30 village men along the entire part of the southern Nepal to monitor tiger in their village. So if someone saw a tiger or someone's livestock were killed, this person would be in charge of, of looking to see, he was trained to know if it was a leopard or a tiger print and what kind of kill it was and he kept all this data. So we interviewed them about why the reasons for becoming a ranger. And this is just, we interviewed about 25 of the rangers or so. So this is just the number that mentioned um, reasons for becoming a ranger and the current benefits that they perceived at the time of the survey. And uh, these are the categories of answers they gave to the open-ended questions. And three of them stayed about the same over time. You know, they said, oh, I get some pocket money because they were paid a small salary. They found it to be an interesting activity and they learned new things that they didn't know. And then three benefits that actually increased over time were they said their interest in conservation was important. They got to travel because they got to go to trainings with the other tiger rangers so they would all meet a few times. Uh, and their social standing in their own community, right? They became an expert in something. People came to them. They gave them some standing of a different kind. So, you know, as you can see, money plays a role, but it's not the only thing. And we found the same thing in Assam when we asked forest rangers why they participated in a community-based program. And we asked them, why did you join? And, you know, what are the benefits now? And you can see that it's interesting here because um, Conservation was the main reason that they said they joined, 75%. And this was because the local forests were being um, illegally, the timber was being illegally cut by outside poachers, timber cutters. And so they all wanted to protect their local forest around their village. Um, and then for a lot of people it was economic, supplemental or primary income, that's why they joined. And some said self-motivation. But when we asked them the benefits of being involved at the time of the survey, which is about five or six years into it, um, all of a sudden, so extraction, was really high. And this is because once they protected, they were then able to extract and get the benefits from it. Uh, and then, but friends was just as high. The friends they made in these groups, the, the bonds they had with their fellow guards was very important to them, obviously. Um, and the discipline they learned, because these, these groups are sort of quasi-military uh, and they are all male. And so they were trained by an ex-military person, sort of felt like they learned a lot of skills from that training. Um, their environmental knowledge was a benefit, their interactions with people, not just their friends, but other people also that they might not interact with, and then a job. It did, I think it's important, it's probably, it could be really important, but when you ask them what are the actual benefits on a day-to-day -day thing, that's not the primary thing after a few years, right? It's all these other social, more diverse set of benefits and the extraction. Uh, so community conservation is powerful 
because it builds on the diverse values that people already have. It's not a matter of us convincing people that protected areas are important. You know, just because they're poor, I mean, because they're poor, they know even better than we do sometimes, because they really rely on those areas and they live right next to them. And uh, even so even around protected areas where we would expect people to be the most negative because conflicts are the highest and you've got the most problems with often the government management, um, there's still so much potential for community support and involvement as you can see from the values that people said they had towards the areas. And I just want to bring this up to a bigger scale than of what this means for conservation across a larger landscape. And a couple of programs, national programs, that really rely on, on community values and, and you know, conservation actions are Nepal, which I've already mentioned, where the local communities um, manage more than 30% of the forest. And it's held up as a prime example of community forestry globally. And then Namibia, where more than 17% of the country is um, um, conserved in community wildlife conservancies, where people are, are getting benefits from the wildlife in those areas. Um, and so what the basis of these, these are successful because people have these values, right? They're not successful because outsiders came in and told them that it was important. They already, and you can look at the history of these programs and see how it, these were like local sparks of people saying we need to conserve. And then they provided the examples locally that became national policies. And what's interesting is even though we know this, and all conservationists know communities can be important, how little effort and funding and, and programming we still we put into communities. And there's a report that came out from the, um, the National Committee on Responsive Philanthropy a few years ago, which talks about um, how much money actually goes to marginalized communities or, or to social justice strategies. Looking at the US foundations and the grants they gave, what percentage went to those things. And it's very low. And this is, this is, so this is all the money going to hundreds of, of groups, NGOs, including like WWF. Nature Conservancy, Conservation International, the big ones, right? And the numbers are very, very low um, in what goes there. So why aren't we supporting community conservation more? These are the constituencies on the ground. Social movements come, change comes from on the ground. So why don't environmentalists support communities more when they have these values, we have these examples that are, that are so amazing of why it's, why it's useful? It seems like it should be a part of every program that happens. And even in my own experience, I see that um, in Myanmar right now, where I've worked for a long time, and now the NGOs are starting to come, up, come in because it's opened up. So I've worked there since 1999 with the Smithsonian, and in the last five years, because of democracy and the elections, a WWF and TNC, they're all starting to come in and start programs. And w, I don't, I don't want to pick on WWF, because WWF actually supported those Namibia and Nepal programs. They've supported them for a long time, right? So they've been supportive of community conservation. But they came into Myanmar, and they had me do some work, and they had some other work on communities. And they decided, no, we don't want to go with communities. We, we want to worry about infrastructure and the big companies that are going to be investing. So they're putting their time and money into the high-level policy, and they're not putting any money or time into local communities and figuring out how to support those policies, which I find fascinating, right, how we still have a hard time translating these really basic lessons across countries. Um, so we're going to be working on that. We're going to try and, and turn that around in Myanmar. And this is just to end again with, we need to turn it around because there are people in every village who want to protect their environment and their villages and make things sustainable and healthy, right? So this is, this is a picture of um, Lakshmi, who I showed you initially. This is, you know, 20-some years later, and she's had a very uh, interesting and, and difficult life. She was kicked out of her village for a long time because of the Maoist activity. The government accused her of being a Maoist and she had to go to India where she learned a phenomenal number of skills because northern India they have a lot of community development programs like making juice from berries and all sorts of small um, productive activities like that. So she came back to the village three, two or three years ago, started up her own NGO that I was there for the opening of it and she's trying really hard to make a go and, and make things happen in her village. And again, I go to all the NGOs and I say, we need to support her. You know, you're, you have a program in this Bardia National Park. Here's a local person with her own. It's a woman. It's even a woman, which we know is so important to support. And it's just really hard to get traction. It's really, really hard. So um, the lesson for all of us, I think, sitting here on Earth Day in the US is to think about how can we support these community actions, right? Like how can we, whenever we give money to an organization or we talk to someone, if you give money, just you know, ask them, what are they doing for communities? Just we just need to show that we care and we know this is important to be supporting people at the ground level. So that's my, my Earth Day method, message. I don't normally have, you know, like a get on a bully pulpit or anything. But for Earth Day, I think it's important for us to really think about those values that, that we share with people all over the world. And that's the end. Thank you. Thanks for your time today.
All right, everybody, we are going to open it up for some questions. So our students will be walking around with microphones. Please wait until you have a microphone so we can hear all the excellent things you have to ask. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm curious in the um, sort of positive perceptions, how much of it do you think was um, people's perception that the protected area would actually create job opportunities for them as rangers and as other kinds of things versus potentially take away or cause the loss of jobs that might have been happening in the local economy? So uh, I don't, I think if they felt like jobs are important, it would come out as a benefit, right? They might, we, we are getting these jobs, or it would come out as a problem, we're not getting the jobs. Um, so people do not, and there, in most of these areas, it's not an opportunity for them. There are no jobs that they get, right? The government staff comes from outside, they're not hired locally. And there can be some daily lab, labor that goes on in some of the parks. And it, so it came up a little bit in terms of that, like we might get hired for a few days here and there. Um, but it's not that important. Most of the money in all these protected areas that comes in, you know, it goes to investors from the capital cities. It goes to people who work in hotels and they don't want to hire locally because labor isn't dependable if they're local. Someone gets sick, they don't show up for work. But the, the good thing I can say in Nepal is they've been going through this process for a good, you know, 20 or 30 years in terms of tourism and the tourism money. And like I said, so the tourism money in the buffer zones in Nepal 30 to 50 percent gets redistributed back to communities. So they are, I mean, they are really starting to link, you know, the money overall to the protected area. Um, and when I was there just a year ago doing a review for USAID, one of the things I saw was that now in Nepal, with the education system being much, much better and more kids getting an education, which does them literally no good because there are no jobs, but they're sitting in villages wanting to do things. And so, you know, WWF almost by accident in this particular case, or the NGOs have started to hire people. And I'm like, this guy's local, you know, he's amazing. He's a local person you've hired and you need to do more of this, right? Nepal's at a point where the protected areas have done so well and the economy's doing well and they've got remittances coming from outside so people are getting fairly well educated. They should be hiring local people around these protected areas. They should be the, the, you know, the guards and they should get rid of the army ultimately. And so there's a lot of potential there but it's not being used yet. Sorry, long answer to your question, but an important piece that's not really, um, important yet, <laughs> as it should be. Yeah. You've been asking the people who, are, who live close to the protected areas how they feel about it. What about the people who are far away from it and don't see the benefits as much? Did you do any, any question, give them any questions about how they feel about uh, the, the <coughs> these protected areas? So I just want to ask, what do you mean by far, maybe, from your perspective? Do you mean, like, any distance, or are you well, thinking guess, of... I guess on your map, you, you had the protected area, and then you had all the places you visited were right next to it. Yeah. And those people could benefit because they're, they're right there, but people who live farther where it would be a trip to go enjoy those benefits, how do they feel, or, or do they feel like this is a waste of money and our country should be using these uh, lands mm -hmm. to make money? Well, I haven't done I haven't done those surveys, but there are people who do surveys of you know urban residents versus the rural and things. And in in general, I think those people don't suffer costs from it. They don't see costs from protected areas. So, in general, most people still see a certain set of benefits from them. But I you know I haven't done the surveys to compare it to mine. Um, and and just to clarify a little bit, so what we did is surveyed the villages that usually that wardens felt like had a relationship with a protected area. So it could be farther away if people were coming to extract resources and things. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to say about that. Um, yeah, and certainly people outside of protected areas in like Nepal get the, all the tourism benefits. So even if they don't live right next to it, they all know tourism is really, really important. And actually Nepal has a, a phrase, a national phrase that everybody knows is Nepal Kodan Haryoban, which is Nepal's wealth is green forest. So I'm sure in Nepal you'd hear that from like everybody. They all recognize forest as important. So I'm sure they're very supportive all over Nepal. Myanmar, some of those people may not even know what a protected area is because there's just so little knowledge about them right now. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, so you mentioned there were some innovative uh, conservation strategies. So for the protected areas, are most of these like strictly protected areas where there's no human, like there's no extractive use, so there's no like mixed use in the area, or is there kind of a variety of mixed use and strict protected areas? And if so, do you see like any difference in the perceptions of benefits and positive attitudes towards strictly protected areas versus mixed use? So Nepal and Myanmar, the areas where we did the survey, do not have any mixed use per se. They do have the legal extraction of thatch, which is a huge benefit to people, so that makes a huge difference. Um, China has more of that model where they have mixed use across a protected area, and I didn't, in the area we were in, it didn't really seem to play much of a role. Like, no one mentions that, no one really talks about it. Um, so, I mean, the, the bigger question is, yeah, the more they can benefit, whether it's legal or illegal, whatever kind of mixed use, it, it increases the number of, of benefits and values that come out of that protected area. But all these by law are pretty strictly protected, except for the thatch issue in, in Nepal. So it's not a model more like South America, that's some more mixed use that goes on. There's no models like that. Myanmar has a lot of land that could be protected but isn't. Do you feel good about the future of protection of those areas by the Myanmar people? I feel good in the long run because the trends when you look at countries is they protect land over the long run, even if they're losing it at the same time, which is what's going to happen in Myanmar for a while. They're going to lose it fast for a while because the number of companies that are coming in and even when I was there in January talking to people, all the NGOs, the environmental NGOs, have decided to work in one small part of Myanmar down in the south, which is considered to be the most biodiverse, even though the whole country is biodiverse. And they're all fighting and squabbling over turf down in this one small area. Um, and the rest of the country is virtually being ignored by environmental money in terms of protected areas and biodiversity. Um, and so that's disappointing, right? That's not helpful to protecting more of that land. But there are some projects, and I think with a number of NGOs coming in, that over, over the long run, they'll do it, right? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a development ideal for every country to protect 15 to 20% of its, its land, right? So they're gonna do that policy-wise, because that's what's expected. And that if you're a developed, developing country, if you, if you have good policies, that's just what you do, is you protect some percentage of your land. So we're gonna see the number of protected areas going up. A lot of them are gonna remain uh, paper parks, because they're not going to have all the money they need. But even paper parks are more effective than nothing. So I am very hopeful. Uh, hopeful, And I think after working, I mean, Nepal in the 70s was facing the Himalayan degradation theory, where they thought, you know, there were predictions by 2000, all the forest in Nepal, gone. They're going to be starving, they're going to be deserts, there's going to be nothing. And you look in, in 2000, and they have more forests now than, than they did in the 70s, the forest has increased. So, so part of it is, is people blowing the horn and saying, there's a disaster coming, but they've done really well, and communities have played a huge part. So overall, when I look at Nepal, I'm hopeful that for all the negative predictions, which I could also say for Myanmar, that in the end, um, in, these, in these particular countries in the Himalaya, the, the environment is very important to people, and it's a very clear link, and in the end, it gets saved somehow, especially as it starts to disappear, like in Chitwan, when you know, the, the tractors are in there in the 70s. As it starts to disappear, people get worried and really start protecting it. So, so I'm hopeful in that way, but they will lose a lot, which is very, very sad. Right, and they shouldn't, because we, we know how to protect it, and we know how important it is, but the policies and the government. So USAID right now, for example, they say, well, you know, Myanmar, we're not putting biodiversity or environmental money into there. Our priorities are governance and health. So all their programs are governance and health. And governance and the environment have some huge links. In Nepal, the community forests, when they didn't have elections or a government for the past 10, 15 years during the Maoist conflict, those community forest committees kept functioning. They locally kept having elections. It was the one piece of democracy left in Nepal. So the environment governance links are so tight. So again, a lesson we know, but in Myanmar, we can't convince them that that means anything in terms of the funding streams. Governance people who control the governance money are like, sorry, that's just not what, you know, we're doing elections at you know, national level and for, for states and districts, we're not, you know, we're not worried about people managing their local forests. It's just not our our area. So, yeah. So hopeful, but uh, it'll be a little sad for a while, too. Uh, 
Here in the, uh, in the United States, uh, there seems to be some controversy uh, over our own protected areas. Some people like it, some people don't. I'm just wondering, are there any lessons from your research that might apply here that, that we should use in terms of maybe uh, eliminating or, or lessening the conflicts or maybe even preserving more, more areas? Yeah, so it's interesting. You bring up an interesting issue that the developing world conservation and developed world conservation are two different playing fields in a way. And there's very little research or, or lessons that, that draw upon both of them. So it's something that sometimes can be hard to think about. Um, and, I, and I don't do domestic work, so I don't know it well enough to have all, you know, to know how it compares exactly. But, and it's interesting because we actually just, um, I was in a, a seminar recently where all the people under like 30 in the room thought that in terms of protected areas, we should be moving, we shouldn't try and protect more land in a fines and fences approach. That we need to think about multiple use and, and the different values and how people can be on the landscape and still be conserving it without locking it up. And everyone that was older that worked in biodiversity thought, no, protected areas, protected areas, protected areas. So the, there could be some generational changes that are coming to thinking about this, this issue that maybe younger people are like, well, we've, we just can't lock things up. It's not a model that works. And I know in the US, they just haven't, they call it collaborative conservation here, right? So the approach to it has been very, very different. Like out west, so they don't say community, it's, it's collaborative conservation because it's a higher level trying to bring, bring stakeholders together. And like I, I live out in Mesomany, and I'm like, yeah, how would community conservation work out here in Mesomany? We've got these, the Wolf Run Trail, which is really community-based conservation, but you know, I don't want to be on a local committee. Like everyone in Nepal is on like three committees, three local you know, community committees, a health committee, a forest committee. I'm like, I'm not doing that at the local, you know, I'm not doing that. So it's an interesting question to think about. How would the models, what, which pieces of the model transfer and which don't? And, and maybe they should transfer more than they do. I probably should be on three committees in my local town. That's where I live. It's my sense of place, right? Instead, I'm jetting off to Asia all the time. So, yeah, interesting questions that I don't have good answers for. Do we have any last questions? All right, well, please give her one more round of applause. Thank, thank all of you. Thank you, thank you. so much.